Today I'm at Rose Creek Farms in Selmer, Tennessee, but I'm not going to be talking to the farm owner, Ray Tyler. Instead, I'm going to be talking to one of the people that works for Ray here at Rose Creek Farms, Stephen Hobbs, and we're going to get what it's like to work for a farmer on a farm instead of just the farmer's view like you tend to hear a lot. Stay tuned. It's coming up here right now. Stephen, we're at Rose Creek Farms, mm -hmm. Ray Tyler's farm. You're a full-time employee here. How's it been working on the farm for Ray? Uh, it's been great. He's a great guy to work for. Um, we grew up together, so um, my my coming back to uh, moved back to Tennessee recently, and he just hired me on to help out. Works for me because uh, my kids are on the property. We homeschool, so it's a great family environment. And um, and uh, we go we've worked together for years in different fields of work. We were carpenters together, so coming out here is just like coming back to old friends and just a matter of uh, changing up on the tools. So in a lot of ways, it's a friendship, partnership, Most versus definitely. just a you know, boss employee. It is a little different. Yeah, there, it's a special situation, I guess, you know. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're friends, and yet we both know I, he's worked for me, and now I'm working for him. So when you think about farm work, you know, your role on the farm is doing a lot of the cultivation, the field work here. I know Ray focuses a lot on sales. He's doing a lot of those things. When people get interested in vegetable farming, I don't think they have a real concept of what field work is like over those long hours over a full season you've been here all year mm -hmm. what would you say to somebody who wants to get into farming about the realities of field work it's a, just a lot of hard work um, you know we um, we typically are out here at five in the morning trying to beat the heat uh, we'll be off at one and um, you know spend time with our families and um, yeah it's just a lot of hard work uh, most of the time we don't even get it all done I mean, we've got a list he'll give us in the morning and then we'll, we'll generally not even get to it all you know and, and it's just constant all summer long just prioritizing sure everything and um, you know one thing Ray tells us is a lot of people have a romantic idea of farming and you guys are gonna get to feel what it's really like to farm you know and, and we do we get out there and we break our breaking our backs you know we're broad forking you're transplanting your you know the harvesting all those things are very hard to do you know um, coming into farming, I didn't realize how much hard work there really was, um, and and you know we started to do more of the harvesting, and I'm realizing, wow, I kind of wish Ray and Ashley would take that back over. <laughs> <you> <laughs> a know. lot of work, right? Like, yeah. Like say to harvest a typical bed of lettuce. I mean, you exactly. guys use the quick greens harvester. Well, we use the greens hit? harvester on um, just the arugula and the brisca, but not not the salanova. Not the salanova. salanova is all by hand. You know, all we right, got so these little knives and. So give people That's it. what what life is like with that knife when you got to harvest a hundred foot. Bucks. Yeah, so you're walking along, you're just bending over your your salad, and you're making your cut, and you're looking through, make sure we're good, throw it in. You know, if it's bad, throw it out. You know, and, not necessarily uh, probably not the most fun job in the world. No, no, I'm six three. I don't like being down close to the ground. You know. Sure. So so the collinear hose, anything that keeps me more upright position, you know, is is what I like. You know, I know Ray started on this farm, he had a lot of weed pressure because this was just pasture for the most part when he started. Mm -hmm. What do you think, from your experience working in the field, what have been some of the keys to weed management? Uh, I would say tarping things has been huge. Um, you're literally, you're cutting off the sunlight, you're cutting off more moisture because out here we can grow grass real good. Like, like some of these beds, we'll clean them out, crop them out and we'll get a nice rainstorm to come through and then all of a sudden, bam, there's just a green carpet sometimes in these older beds, the ones sure. that haven't been worked as much. Um, and so it's just a constant pressure. So it's just, you, you gotta figure out what you're gonna do, you know? And if you're gonna flame weed, there's this little window of opportunity to flame weed. If you're gonna, you know, till it and, and tarp it, or, you know, you gotta make a game plan. Right. And sometimes, you know, having your beds, you know, we're just like moving across these fields, just plant, you know, crop out, plant, crop, you know, just constantly flipping. And so sometimes it's not easy to get the tarp in there. And so you have to kind of just do it the hard way. Weeding is one thing a lot of farmers don't like. For you, you know, a collinear hoe, it sounds like that's not so bad. If you right. think about the tasks on the farm that you do, mm -hmm. what one do you dislike the most? If like Farm Genie could show up and take it over for you, what would it be? Well, it'd be the transplanting and the and the harvesting. Yeah. I mean, the, anything that's down low and on the ground like yeah. that, it's just those are the hardest. And, and I think you'll get used to it when you do it longer. I think there is a there is a thing of being able to be stretched out, you know, and for bending over a lot. And then there's just a lot of the, the muscles that have to be built, you know, because when I first started, 
I, it was it was pretty bad. I mean, I was in a lot of pain. Yeah. You know, get home and be like, oh man, this is killing <laughs> me. You know, but after a while, you you adjust to you it. You adjust to it. You, you do. get used you to really it. You really do. And it's one of those things like it's got to be done. Mm -hmm. If nobody likes it, it's kind of too bad, so sad. Like, exactly. Farm's not going to run without it. Right. I mean, that's true. And and it is a very satisfying job. It really is. I mean, we have our days where it's like, you know what? We're just mow it down. We're starting over. And some days we've, you know, mowed stuff down and be like, oh, we're about to harvest that. It's like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's your moments of, man, that, that was a mistake. Sure. But, um, or that went bad. And, all that hard work just went to waste. The bugs got it, or whatever. Yeah. But most of it's not that. You know, most of it's it's successes. When you look at your time that you spent here, what's the thing that you're most proud of? Probably most proud of of the ability to number one help Ray, but um, number two actually learn, um, you know, how to grow things, how to actually uh, grow things in a holistic way. Uh, you know, where we're not having to use. Um, things that I wouldn't want to put in my kids' mouths, you know, as far as chemicals or pesticides or things like that. So watching Ray having to battle the elements and uh, pests and, you know, bad soil conditions and things like that um, and do it in a holistic way has really been um, the thing I've enjoyed getting to learn myself, you know. I don't know that I'll always be farming, sure. you know, um, but at the same time, what I've learned here, I'll be able to take and use other places, you know, and, and whether it's my own garden, or, or whatever. What's been the toughest part for you of going from what you thought you knew about growing to actually growing on a production scale on a farm that needs continual consistent production? Uh, I think I, I just figured farming was going to be hard but um, I don't know that I knew it was going to be as hard as it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know because there's some 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 days when it's 100 degrees and you're, you're out there broad forking and you're just like wow I, I I thought there was implements for this, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. or it doesn't really matter what you're doing out there when it's just, when it's brutally hot, you know, you're, you're looking for, you're dealing with it. You're just dealing with it, sure. you know, and, and but it, it's like that with everything you do, I think. Of your time spent here, is there any improvements or things that Ray's changed on the farm that came from your suggestion that have worked out really well? He's always been pretty open. Um, I think he's always looking to, to, to us for ideas, you know, it's like with our, I think our, our irrigation system is more or less always a work in progress. You know, let's move them closer, let's move them further apart, you know, we need to change the tips, you know, we're getting dry areas, you know, or we'll run an irrigation uh, line and we'll notice on a tarp four or five rows over that the fourth row is getting hit at the back end, but on the front end, the fifth row is getting hit. So it tells us we have a pressure problem. So we'll go to Ray and go, Ray, you know, we're gonna switch out these tips. What do you think? And we'll brainstorm. We'll be like, well, let's try the, the turquoise tips, you know, or the green tips. Right. And let's see what we can, if we can get a nice even coverage. From a just employee, employer relationship, you're on the employee side of mm -hmm. things and knowing that Ray's open, for people that have employees, you know, what would you suggest? What are ways you think to get the most out of your employees or to really open up that line of communication or to encourage their suggestions? You know, what are your thoughts as somebody who, who works for somebody who allows that and, and encourages it? Um, well, one thing I know about Ray is he's very encouraging. You know, he comes out every day, he'll, he'll walk the farm. You know, we'll get things to do, but he'll always end up going, guys, things are looking good, you know? And um, there may be a time where we, we have to get down and dirty and we have to deal with situations, but he's always in the end encouraging us and going, man, this is, this is way better than last year. You guys have no idea. You know, this is, this is really, really good. You know, and so you just end up feeling like, okay, we're actually making a difference. And if you feel like you're making a difference for that person and if you're really there to serve them and you feel like you're seen and you're heard as an employee, you know, uh, not all our ideas are, are, are taken up and, and used. They just, sometimes he's like, I see what you're saying, but I still, I'd rather it be done this way. Right. You right. know, and we have to be okay with, hey, you know, half of our ideas are heard, half of them aren't, and we have to be okay with that, you know? So yeah, there's you just... do have to have a maturity on your side as a guy giving you ideas, but right. at the same time, you know, if you feel like you were, at least were heard out, and he, he thought about it, but he's been doing it for seven years, or six years, whatever it's been, then you have to you have to let the guy make the decision. Sure. Know? He's got the bigger picture. It takes both sides. You need that long-term vision 
you need the execution in the field, you mm -hmm. need the continuous improvement, and oftentimes it's not <clears throat> one person that can do all of that well at the oh, same yeah. time, very hard. So you do need you know good people in the field doing it. And there's a saying that's something like, one thing that makes people happy is achievement and being recognized for that achievement. Right, yeah, and I'd say Ray does that well. Right on. Mm -hmm. Of the crops that you guys grow here, what's your favorite one to grow? Probably Salanova. I mean, it's just, we put it in, we, we can paper pot a, 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 a bed, you know, in 15 minutes or so, and we can set out the sprinklers and let them run, and it just grows. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You just don't have to do much at all. We might have to do a little bit of weeding in between, but it just takes off, and it's a, it's a real easy crop to, to deal with. So One thing I know Ray's had a lot of success with here in Tennessee, growing lettuce in the south. Yes. Hot, humid, a lot of people have trouble, a lot of people just shut down greens in the summer down here. It bolts too quickly, they get bitter, have problems in the field transplanting. What do you think has been the key? You know, if there's one thing that has really helped grow Salanova throughout the year, what is it? I personally couldn't tell you what the difference has been because I've never tried to grow, never really heard about the issues. But, you know, coming in, I've watched Ray just, um, I think he just has to figure out what the plant needs. So we do shade cloth. Um, After transplant, transplant shade cloth. Well, yeah, it, tran right? once it's in the field, we, tra we, we have shade cloth, we water it. And, um, you know, it's just a little bit of a baby, baby it to get sure. it going, you know? And then once it's going, you can uncover it and just let it go. And um, I don't really know what all the issues in the South have been for people, except maybe just that right there. Right. Getting it to get past the first week. So get some resiliency built in. I think you guys leave the shade cloth on for two weeks, usually after transplant? Um, it varies, you know, yeah. it just it's, depends on your weather. You know, I've, it just, it change, I just go, you know, Ray's like, hey, this is ready to uncover. Or, you know, we walk the field. We don't really, I don't know that we have so much of a set thing as we sure. just, we walk around, use some intuition. What you about know. water regimen when you do the transplanting in the in the heat of summer? Are you watering more frequently? Uh, yeah, I mean, as soon as we get them in the ground, it's a two hour soaking, mm -hmm. just two hours, just hit it hard, um, really water it in. And then we will definitely watch it the next day and probably give it another hour in the morning. Keep an eye on it that afternoon. If, it, if it's looking dry, do it again. Sure. You know, give it another hour. Um, but there again, it's every week's different. And um, some, some of these beds are different. Some beds hold moisture better than others because they've had more compost put into right. them. In terms of tools you guys use on the farm, what is the, your favorite tool to use or one that you think makes your job the easiest? Uh, the BCS. Yeah. I, I love using the BCS because you're just, you're just walking behind it. You're just steering it down the bed. You know, if we want to clean out a, a, a crop, we can flail mow the top off, like the arugula we did over there. So we'll flail the top of the arugula off. All the vegetation is pretty much gone. You know, you're not going to have to bunch that up and carry it to the compost. And then you can go through with about an inch, inch and a half deep, you know, till with the harrow. And then you just go back with the leaf rake, pick up all your roots, throw them in a wheelbarrow, and, um, and then take that to compost. Sure. So you might have two loads as opposed to five or six. And then um, you come back in with your broad fork if you need it, or you know compost and fertilizer mineral pack, and then you set your harrow down deep, and then you run it again, two minute run on 100 foot bed, and we're, we're good to go. Tarp it, cover it, plant, whatever you want to do, you know? So the implements you guys have for the BCS down here, you have the, the main tiller, we have a the tiller. power harrow, the flail mower and then the rotary plow. Yes. Those are the main ones. And, yes. You know, of those, it, it, is the power harrow maybe the... Oh, that's the, number one. That's number uh, one, that, yeah. That's on that machine 99% of the time. Right on. Yep, most definitely. Because the advantages of the power harrow as I see it, tell me if I'm wrong or tell me if I'm missing something, you're not inverting the soil, you're not pulling up weed seeds because it's got this twisting motion to disturb the soil and you prepare a nice seed bed. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. and it, it's just a smooth running machine, and it, and it, and it has the roller on the back. So when we're done, you have a nice flat surface that's totally ready to plant in. So right here, you have one of the farmer's friend caterpillar tunnels. How's that work for you guys? Uh, they work great. I mean, it, it keeps the rain off of our off of our beds, and so this time of year, typically not this year, but typically it's just constant rain and cold, mud. You know. It's, it's not good for um, the plants or for us. So these will help keep our, our beds drier. We can control the amount of moisture we have. It helps with the frost and the cold weather. And we can get in here and work 
and get out of the wind sure. because typically in December we're going to get some just cold, cold winds blowing. That's one nice thing about these. I mean, you can fully stand under them, no problem, and you can fit four 30-inch beds in here, yes. no problem. How does it work in the outer beds? Does it, be, it slope and down? It, it, yeah, it can be a little bit of a pain, but I mean, you don't do a whole lot anyways. Um, as far as like, I mean, how often are you working in a bed? You know, sure. you're putting your plants in, you're letting them grow, and this is a slow time of year. We may come in with a collinear hoe, and you're you're gonna bump, you're gonna be up against the the side, and if you have to end up broad forking, that's a little tricky too. But um, the other benefits really outweigh all that. And, and as far as the, we can get the paper pot to run next to the to the wall, and uh, the BCS will run right up there next to the wall too. So you know. It, it works. I mean, we would love it if they had straight sides for four feet and then a hoop, Right. but well, I like it's not the, a high tunnel. I like the point you're making, too, of uh, it's only inconvenient for a limited amount of time. Exactly. You're not in there every day on that wall, and for the price of, I think they're about 1100 bucks for a 100-foot one, a lot cheaper than a high tunnel. Yes, yeah, and that, that's, that's, I think, the selling point yeah. of a good way to get something out there to protect your crops, give you something to work in and uh, you're, not, you're not sinking that much money. Right. A caterpillar tunnel that you can fit four beds under, one thing that that replaces is in the field row cover. They could cover a single bed, it could cover two beds with mm -hmm. these wire hoops like this. Have you used this much and what are your thoughts on using this system versus a caterpillar tunnel? Uh, well, the only thing with these is you're not gonna get the moisture control uh, because you're not, typically not gonna run plastic on these. Um, I, I guess you could, but you're probably going to be chasing that plastic a lot more than you'd want to be because uh, it's just going to catch wind a lot easier than most of your other um, uh, covers. Uh, we typically use these for uh, shade cloth. You've got your frost cr cut cloth covering and then you've got your uh, bug netting. Right. So these are very useful and they're very, um, you know, for one thing, uh, maybe one bed, maybe only one bed needs it or a section of area needs it. Whereas this takes hours to put up. Sure. These are put it in, take it off, you know, right. uh, a lot more control and, and ability to um, use in a different area. And you know, when you're flipping stuff and you're really doing production, you know, during the summer, these things would probably get to be a headache. Right, right. You know? You know, w one thing that I could see people saying about this is, snow load you don't have a lot of that down here no. the other thing is wind and you do get some heavy winds down here in the south i don't know if this is tornado country if oh it, yes so oh, heavy yeah. winds and some people could look at this thing and say yeah i'm right. nervous on that what's been your experience with the caterpillar tunnels and wind well uh, um, it's a good question and actually just last week we had a storm come through more or less a front and it just brought some straight line winds and it was reported you know seven miles from here the storm was moving 65 miles an hour from the weather service and they were telling us that we were getting straight line winds of 60 miles an hour and uh, the only tunnel we had an issue with was the very end tunnel out by itself kind of got the brunt of the storm and it only broke the one clamp right here at the top of the end and it shoved the first hoop in but we were able to see that it was something wasn't right and we got out there and we we were able to tie it back down and put it all back in place um, so that was really a uh, good test and the rest of the uh, nine tunnels did fine and we would probably add an angle brace like we have on these over here we've got a little bit of an angle brace and i think it would have helped a little more just to stiffen it up. Just stiffen that stiffen very end. And, and you know, there's probably some other things we could do to help keep that from happening. One modification you guys have done to the tunnel, pretty inexpensive, is you've put the, the channel lock on here mm -hmm. with the wiggle wire to allow the end plastic to create more of a flat door yes. than that bundle that people pull on the end and hook it to a stake, which is, it's kind of inconvenient. Very. How has this worked? So far, it's worked well um, in the storm you know, the doors were pretty much flapping in the breeze. I mean, they, they were they were literally flapping in the breeze, but it's like... But they're not tearing, so not a big deal. They didn't tear, um, and it wasn't uh, an issue of like, oh no, cold air's getting in, because it wasn't that cold. And uh, so we rolled them up. We just thought, you know what, let okay. the wind go through. And when it's cold at night, and we walk through, and we just lower all the doors, they overlap about 16 inches or so, and we throw a sandbag on them, and then, you know, try to contain the heat that the sun has in there before the night comes. Right. You know? One of the things Ray has a lot of on the farm is caterpillar tunnels. There's quite a few of them. I don't know, maybe eight of them. 
and they serve a lot of purposes. They protect your crops from the rain, they protect your crops from the cold, and it's a cheaper way of getting some season extension than building a high tunnel would be. Now, a high tunnel is optimum in some cases for more reasons, for many reasons, but it's also more expensive. At $1,000 or a little over $1,000 for a 100-foot bed on a Caterpillar tunnel, that's cheap compared to a high tunnel on a per square footage basis, and it's gonna be a lot less work than if you're dealing with row cover or putting plastic over hoops in the field. It all comes down to your context. What do you wanna do? Do you wanna do a bunch of work setting up the hoops and removing them every time you have to tend to the crop? Or do you wanna invest in this, which is kind of the intermediary step between row cover and high tunnels, which is a caterpillar tunnel. If you're looking for these, they're sold by Farmer's Friend, who's out of Tennessee, up by Nashville. There's a link to the caterpillar tunnels below. I like them, they're slick, they're easy to set up, can be put up in about an hour, relatively cheap compared to other forms of season extension. And one thing I like about them, you can just walk in them and not have to worry about moving that plastic every time. That's easy. Now we're looking inside one of the Caterpillar tunnels right here. You have some Sensig or Wobblers behind us. How's that work for you? We typically can get them to throw um, four beds either side. Okay. And um, we'll do a little bit of overlap, but inside of here, the, this is kind of a temporary thing until we put in some overhead, but I feel like, you know, even still, it, it disperses it up into the air. We're hitting the tunnel, which is dispersing it again. Right. So we're getting a nice soft rain type uh, irrigation going on in here right now. Better than drip. Uh, I, I like it better than drip. Drip's kind of, you can't see it. You don't know what's going on. I feel like you have to walk around and feel and check and make yeah. sure everything's working right um this is very obvious That's i can walk point. through a field and get a see, good visual oh very visual i can walk up oh, dry spots what's going on we got something plugging the the orifice you know paper pot transplanter something i'm very familiar with how's it worked out for you guys so far on the farm um as far as us being the guys putting the plants in the ground we love it anytime we can use one we would prefer it just because it's one man doing all the work that normally two guys would have to do just to to do it within a timely manner. So um, typically, uh, once the bed is all prepped, you know, we get the plants out here and you can run a bed, 100 foot bed, probably five rows in about, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, once you've learned, you know, there are some nuances to the, to the, to the implement and your soil right. and the settings, but you know, once you get those things rolling and you've got an idea how you like it done, and how to do it on your property and your, your situation, then I, I think 15, 20 minutes is very uh, reasonable. That's one thing that, you know, Judah was talking about on it is, it's not necessarily a tool you're gonna pick up like a shovel and know right. how to use right away. That's true. And it, he almost said like, you have to know bed by bed. Yes. Like e each mm -hmm. soil can be different, how you're pulling it, the rate at which you're pulling it at. You know, what don't you like about it or what crops doesn't it work for for you guys? Some of the issues that we've run into with this um, will be if you let your um, crops get real leggy and tall. So if our Salanova, you know, um, just really took off because of the weather or whatever, and it's really tall, it'll, it'll pull other, um, other plants out with it and it'll kind of turn them upside down and things like that. So, so you, there, were, there are issues that you, you can, you know, I think you can take care of if you're if you know what to look for. So don't let your plants get real leggy before you put them in the field because it'll it'll cause issues on the paper pot. Right. A lot of t timing is critical, like a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. In farming, exactly. You know, really having it dialed in, which exactly. only comes from experience. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and we've made those mistakes, and then we know what to look for and be like, you know what, we got to get those in the ground because putting them in the ground is going to become a nightmare, <laughs> and and it will. It'll flip them upside down. It'll. Right pull three chains at a time, they'll go in upside down, you know, and when you're out here fixing stuff or, or even going back and filling in where, let's say it didn't germinate, um, we can go back and fill in a whole bed in the time that it took for him to plant the entire bed. Sure. So you have, you have to really, um, you, you, this whole idea here is to slimline that, um, that time and that labor. I think you guys have done up to seven rows per bed. Yes. With it, how seven versus five, what are your thoughts? Um, it just depends on what you're, you're trying to do. Like, um, you know, some crops, like he did arugula recently, and you know, it's used, you, you wanna be able to go in and use your greens harvester, so you want it tight. Um, but there are crops that during the summer, if they don't have some air between them, you're, they're, they're not gonna grow well, right. or it's, it's, uh, it's not gonna be good. So it just varies on the crops. 
Okay. And that, and that's something that Ray, as the 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 gardener, the guy who knows his plants and what he's trying to do and accomplish, will just give us direction and we just put it in. One of the things people always ask about is how many rows can you fit in a 30 inch bed with a paper pot transplanter? The answer is it, it depends and it depends on what crop you're growing. Right here, they have seven rows in a bed. That's about comfortable maximum. I think Ben Hartman was saying he's fit up to nine rows in a bed, which is gonna be really tight, but seven is kind of the max he felt comfortable recommending. A lot of crops like Salanova might be four or five rows in a bed. Like you see here, this is five, but this arugula is seven rows. Pretty easy to lay out, one down the center, rows two and three on the far edges, and then you just cram your other two rows in the spacings in the middle. That's how you get your seven in. It's tight, but it works. They've had success with it down here at Rose Creek. Ben Hartman's been here recently. One thing he talked about, and he's a big paper pot guy, is he paper pot transplants as much as he can, but he still uses the landscape fabric, or he suggests using the landscape fabric if you have a lot of weeds. How well has the landscape fabric worked in terms of weed control? Oh, excellent. I mean, there, there's almost nothing to do. I mean, you have the occasional weed that'll come up next to your lettuce, or the occasional grass that'll that'll find that, that hole that you made with the, uh, the, the landscapes, you know, the staples to hold it in place. And they will come up through there, but I mean, that's, that's um, you know, a one-time deal. You go in and chop it down or just pull it out. I mean, it's, it's almost less than a couple minutes compared to you can spend, you know, 30 minutes to an hour trying to weed a bed. On a really weedy bed. So yes. yeah, high weed pressure, so, yeah. landscape fabric. Landscape fabric, I'd say, you might as well just say it's none. I, I like the point you made about it's when do you want to do the work? Mm -hmm. Is it during transplanting? Is it weeding? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're going the paper pot, it's faster transplant, but you may have to weed if you have a weed problem. If you're landscape fabric, you have to have the time to prep the landscape fabric, lay it down. Mm -hmm. Do you guys just leave it on the bed all year? No, no. I mean, to crop out, we actually will pull it up. Once it's been harvested, we, we just pull it off and uh, we, we get the root balls out because typically it's a it's a bigger ball because it's uh, typically a head lettuce or something. The like head that. lettuce. So yeah, the crops like the, you said, the kales, mm -hmm. the head lettuce, it's the longer be a bigger term root, crops. And they need to come out for us to get anything in. Right here, we're inside one of the caterpillar tunnels from Farmer's Friend. If you're looking for one of those, you can find a link to that below. But inside this caterpillar tunnel, there's a unique blend here. There's paper pot transplanted lettuce, and there's also lettuce and landscape fabric. And this is done by demonstration, for demonstration purposes. And I asked Stephen, you know, why do you do this? And one thing that it comes down to in a production sense of, are we gonna put our lettuce in landscape fabric, or are we gonna put our lettuce in via the paper pot is, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna weed, or do you wanna save time transplanting? If you have a really weedy plot, it's worth going with landscape fabric to save time in weeding. If you have your weed pressure under control and you only have to do a minimal amount of weeding, then it may be worth looking at the paper pot to save a large amount of time transplanting. And there are better beds that don't have as much weed pressure. They'll do the paper pot to transplant their lettuce because it's much, much faster than transplanting by hand. But in the really weedy older plots and for longer term crops like kales and cabbages and Swiss chard that they harvest over a long period of time, they'll go with landscape fabric. So that's the why of landscape fabric versus paper pot and the pros and cons of each. It all comes down to weeds, how much of, of them do you have, and how do you wanna deal with them? Do you wanna weed or save time transplanting? You're gonna do the work somewhere. Pick where you wanna do that work. You just power harrowed this bed so you could potentially direct seed into it now. It's a nice smooth seed bed. And for direct seeding, you guys like to use the Jang seeder. Yes. How's that worked for you? What do you think are the keys to making it work well? Um, uh, it's pretty easy to, to use. It I just mean, works. It just works, yeah. I mean, uh, you Ray just kind of went, here you go. Here's my, here's my list, you know, this. There, there's some combinations on the machine itself or implement, it's not a machine, you know, different wheels for different seeds and all that, but he literally set me up out here with a list and I was just able to do it. He just went, this is my number of rows, this is how you do it, center, edge, edge, and then fill in, you know, and uh, actually all of these beds uh, to my right, all were direct seeded with the jank, you know, and it's just a real easy implement to use. Okay. So things have, you guys have figured out a process here to make it work mm -hmm. all in when you look at everything you're doing on the farm. 
you know, two, three, four years from now, would you be happy to still be farming? Uh, I think so, you know, I, I it, it, yeah, definitely. Cause it, I, I feel like with Ray, it's always, we're always improving. We're always, there's always a little bit higher to go. There's always a further goal. And there's, you know, when you get down to it, you know, broad forking is, a, is a hard work, but when you're doing it, you, you feel like you're doing something for your, your soil. And you feel like you're giving back to the thing that's gonna give back to you. And so it's hard work, but if you think about what's going on, you know, and, and we like to actually put down our compost on top before we fork. Mm -hmm. So when we do fork and the ground's opened up, I wanna see that compost fall oh, in. Man. And I wanna realize, you know, I'm adding organic matter down deeper than you normally would. And I know for a fact that those worms are gonna eat that. Sure. And so I, I'm, you know, you're just like, you're getting the soil to work with you. You're getting the worms to help you and you're, you're taking care of the entire ecosystem you have. And, and it's just like, it's all, it's like give back, get back. And, and uh, it's a give and get. And it's, it's just so rewarding. I, I don't know how else to say other than you can walk away, look back and go, that's a good job. Or look at those plants grow, you know? And, sure. and, and when you're able to go out there and harvest and then feed people, you know, and, and give food to your kids that you know they can just eat. They can walk out here and just pick it and put it in their mouth and it's perfectly safe. You can't buy that. Yeah, you know? no, it, it's incredible. And you get paid to do it, so and that's I do great. get paid to do it, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and even if I don't continue farming, I think I'll always want to be around to help Ray, you know, whenever he needs it, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great thing to support. There you have it, Stephen Hobbs, one of the workers here at Rose Creek Farms in Selmer, Tennessee. Stephen's brilliant, and it's one thing, one voice that often gets not heard enough in this field are the workers on these farms. There's some brilliant voices that aren't the farmers themselves. There's a lot of people out here doing the work, improving the systems, making them better, and there's a lot of knowledge on the farm. Steven's one of the employees here at Ray's Farm. Another one is Judah. I talked to him yesterday, just an absolute wealth of knowledge. So if you're ever in a farm visit, don't just talk about the farmer about what's going on. Talk to some of the employees about what's going on because they often know a lot about what's going on in the field sometimes maybe even more than the farmer himself does. Great things happening down here in Tennessee at Rose Creek Farms. I'll continue visiting farms throughout the country. Stay tuned for more of those on this channel. Be sure to subscribe to see all those videos. If you want me to visit your farm or come check it out, leave me a note or send me an email or leave one of those comments below and I'll try and get out there at some point because it's really fun seeing these places on the ground.